Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by Fred and Lou Hartwig and viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckettes join me shortly in our topics this week. New year, new county executive, upbeat plans for the Jazz District, and what we will likely know about the news one year from now. But we start with our interview segment and welcome playwright Michelle T. Johnson from StoryWorks KC and investigative reporter Mike McGraw from the Hale Center at KCPT. Our guest will be discussing plans to bring to the stage a story many Kansas Cityans will recall. It's the 1988 explosion in South Kansas City that killed six local firefighters and still raises serious questions about whether those responsible for the crime have been found and punished. The final product of this collaboration will be on stage from February 4th through the 20th at the Living Room Theater, 1818 McGee in Kansas City, Missouri. Michelle, Mike, welcome to Ruckus. Thank you. Sound like a rock group. Mike, Mike, <laughs> and Michelle, it's good to have you with us. Mike, let me start with you. This is a very complex story that you've worked on for years, first at the Star, now at the Hale Center. And we only have about five or six minutes, so we can't go into immense detail, but to the extent you can, would you give us an overview of what this is all about? Sure. Um, in 1988, in November, the six firefighters you mentioned were killed in an explosion that was sparked by an arson fire. Nine years after that, and, and by the way, this explosion is, is in many ways kind of the Kennedy assassination in Kansas City. Anybody who was living here at the time remembers it and probably remembers what they were doing. Um, Nine years after the explosion, five local people who lived in the Marlboro District near the site of the explosion were convicted in federal court and given life sentences, life without parole. I've been working on this story for about a decade, and I think there are many questions uh, about the case in terms of whether the right people were convicted. And just recently, a couple of years ago, the federal government did an independent investigation of the case, uh, sparked by some of the stories the star did. And it found, among other things, that while the witnesses say they were not coerced, and my stories had alleged that they were, I still think some of them were, um, the uh, feds also acknowledged that two more people were involved in the crime who've never been prosecuted. The US attorney here, has declined to talk to me numerous times about why the investigation isn't being reopened to look at those two new So no suspects. investigation is ongoing except perhaps yours? If, if it were ongoing, they wouldn't tell me, but it's been a couple of years and nothing seems to have happened. Michelle, you've written plays before. Is this one more difficult to translate a story this complex to the stage? Yes, because I don't get to make up everything on this one. I have to actually um, pay attention to real life events and honor real life people, Mike, uh, the people that I'm writing about, and just the fact that six firefighters died as part of a tragedy. So yes, I think it's safe to say this is the most difficult play I've ever written. I think all of us were living in Kansas City at the time of the explosion. I cer certainly remember it well. I was working in morning radio with Jerry Fogle at KCMO, and I lived then and still live in Kansas City, Kansas. And this was early in the morning, right, about 4 o'clock? Yeah, just and, after 4 o'clock. Yeah, my wife and I were in our living room and felt this massive blast and had no idea what happened. Then I went to work, and that was the prime topic of the day. We had reporters at the scene talking to firemen. And uh, at first we thought it was just a major fire and explosion, but when we learned there was a fatality and then multiple fatalities, Mike, the whole nature of the story changed. It did, uh, and it was a huge tragedy. Six firefighters in one explosion, I think that set some records uh, then and now. Mm -hmm. um, and of course we've recently lost two additional firefighters to an arson, mm -hmm. to what appears to be an arson fire. Mm -hmm. So I think Michelle's play does a great job of both honoring those of courageous firefighters who died, and also looking into the questions about the case that have been raised ever since. Michelle, people will see this at the Living Room Theater on McGee. Mm -hmm. uh, 
What is the living room theater? Does it live up to its name? Is it like a living room rather than it, a it typical does. theater? It does. It has um, three different theater spots, but they all have um, varying degrees of comfy, cozy chairs and couches. It's it's uh, very well regarded professional theater here in Kansas City. So what's on stage is very much a great theatrical production, but you get to sit in a nice comfy couch if you get there early enough to get your seat. Does the audience take part in this beyond the traditional way of reacting and applauding? Not during the actual production itself. It's an hour-long play, but every play will have a one-hour talkback session, which will feature uh, usually Mike, people hopefully from the fire department, um, uh, people who have a legal perspective on this, maybe if we can get some money from the prosecutor's office, myself as the playwright, the actors, possibly the director, um, but it's a, it's, you, you get another chance after you see it all, both to process the play itself and the facts and issues it raises. Final quick question, Mike, is this the kind of story that makes you glad you chose to be an investigative reporter? Actually, yes, it does. Um, when I first heard the idea that investigative reporting would be put on the stage, my head kind of exploded. And, I, the, the late, and then I realized, that, what a great way to engage new audiences and make some uh, additional comments about this horrible well, tragedy. Thanks to both of you for coming in. Appreciate your time. Thank you. It's Michelle T. Johnson and Mike McGraw. For more information on the project and the performances, go to kcpt.org. Now, let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. Jason Grill is a senior advisor with Paris Communications and the founder of J. Grill Media. Marianne Murray Simons is a freelance writer and consultant. Steve Glorioso is a media and political consultant. And Woody Kozad is president of the Kozad Company, a government relations firm. This is the first program of our 19th season on KCPT, and for the historical record, both Mr. Glorioso and I were on the first one. It's good to have Steve, the panel, all of you back as we start this new year. A lot of things have been said about Mike Sanders over the span of his career as Jackson County Prosecutor and then Jackson County Executive. One thing never said was that he lacked political ambition. And then, just before the calendar jumped to 2016, Sanders surprised virtually everyone and announced he was leaving his job, possibly to resume private law practice. His explanation, a desire to spend more time with his family, a desire apparently heightened by the unexpected death of his father. Sanders was in the second year of his third term as county exec. Kansas City Star says Sanders leaves Jackson County in much better shape than he found it. Do you find that to be an accurate assessment, Mr. Glorioso? First of all, I'm glad you didn't show tape of the original show because I've clearly aged better than you have. <laughs> you have aged better than I have? Well, no. Well, I still have hair. I used to have a little hair oh, no. back then. So that's probably with me. Uh, Mike Sanders did a terrific job, and yes, Jackson County is a lot better shape. Uh, I mean, just on the, the uh, area of ethics, uh, he passed several ethics reforms, which were, were good, needed. Uh, he also, yeah, let me just say, I, it, this thing with the railroad where he's now got commuter ability, rail. Uh, yes, to, to buy the, the right of way. He, he says he has the money in a match with someone. Uh, the assessment, cleaning up the assessment mess. Here's what Mike Sanders, uh, two things. One, I, I think I admire most about him is that he, unlike many people in politics, when he, there's been a screw up like there was on the assessment back two years ago. He didn't hide from it, he didn't obfuscate. He stepped right up and said, we messed this up, we are gonna fix it, and he did. The assessment this year, and I know this first hand was done quite well, and he's doing the same thing with the jail. Secondly, all of the great leaders that I was honored to know and either work for, like George Lear, Dick Bowling, Albert Reeder, they walked away from it. They, and it was an um, honor for them to serve, but they never had the ego. They didn't have to get pushed out. They didn't get defeated in re-election. And I think it speaks well of Mike, and I wish him well. Woody, some people think this pending FBI or ongoing FBI investigation into the jail and a uh, contract that was issued by Jackson County might have played a role in Sanders' decision. What do you think? Uh, I think that's easy to say. Uh, Normally, the U.S. Attorney's Office leaks like a sieve, and, <laughs> and you would have more information than we seem to be getting. Uh, since I don't think they've, uh, discretion is suddenly broken out over there, 
uh, maybe there's less there than you think, because if there were more, they'd let you know and leak it to the Star and make sure it got on page one. Uh, I, I just want to say the Kansas City Star and I so rarely agree that it's worthy of note uh, that, that Mike Sanders leaves the county much better off than he found it. Uh, one of the principal problems of the Democratic Party, in my view, always has been they don't manage things very well. And so even the things they want to do and they want to get done and they believe in, they don't run them very well. Uh, once in a while there comes along an exception and Mike Sanders is, is the exception of the rule. He managed Jackson County really well. I always uh, suspected he was more of a Republican than he would ever admit publicly, uh, Jason. Uh, but Maybe more of a moderate, Mike, right? Uh, but one of the ways most everybody in the metro area associates with Jackson County is through the sports complex, mm -hmm. and that's under the leadership of Jackson County, and Sanders played a huge role in getting it uh, revitalized. For sure, and it's really important because, I mean, look what, look what we have right now in Kansas City with the Royals, the Chiefs. I mean, just having the new state, the refurbished stadiums is huge. But I think people are most shocked by this because he did do such a good job that, you know, why would he move on? And it just doesn't make sense to a lot of people because they're not used to seeing politicians do that without some sort of a something else going on. Well, an ego check. Real right. quickly, though, Catherine Shields is the person, however, who put the deal together with the teams. And, and well, but, but, the, yeah. but yeah. the sales tax yeah, right. was passed right. during the time no. that Sanders was. No, yeah, Shields. yeah, no, Sanders. Uh, I worked on that. One campaign. thing about leading, <laughs> one thing about leading well, the, the, they, they, ha they have sent sales yes. tax in yes. 2004 fact, or 2005. Show you ego is uh, in check. Uh, Shields was not in good shape politically, and Kay Barnes stepped up and ran was the spokesperson for that tax, and it passed while Catherine was. But Mike managed the construction. Uh, you know, okay. Three quarter of a. He played a key role in getting. In done and, and getting done within it done budget and, and that sort of thing. With the sports authority. Uh, Fred Arbanas, a former member of the legislator, legislature, former football player, is mm -hmm. going to be the interim director. And some think that Frank White, a former successful baseball player and broadcaster, may take over the job ultimately. Is it a new rule you have to be a retired Kansas City athlete <laughs> to head uh, the Jackson County uh, legislature, be the county executive? Well, it could be. Maybe we're starting a new trend and maybe it could have something to do with the sports authority. I don't know. Um, I, I think Mike Sanders' legacy that he leaves in the county is not only pulling it together and giving it credibility, but he's also a convener regionally. And I think he did some amazing things in trying to pull together uh, disparate folks and create a future for the metropolitan area, and I give him a lot of credit I for that. I think you would agree with me, Sanders is one of the best public officials to ever interview on radio or television. <laughs> he gives answers to the questions, right. sometimes in far more detail than you ever wanted. But <laughs> an but, interesting but guy. Very right. fast. Smart fast guy. Interesting very guy fast. and uh, very interested in doing what the public thinks yeah. is the right I thing I have high do. regard and a lot of respect for Mike mm -hmm. Sanders. Fifteen years and seventy million dollars of city money later, the 18th and Vine Jazz District is still languishing, failing to bring economic development and tourism to the fabled home of the Kansas City Sound. A city council committee is now reviewing a new plan to revitalize 18th and Vine. If adopted, the cost would be at least seven million dollars, perhaps millions more if a parking facility is added. The money would assist the Buck O'Neill Center, the American Jazz Museum, the Mutual Musicians Foundation, the Alvin Ailey Dance Theater, and the Black Archives in Mid-America. Some big names are backing the project, including Congressman Emanuel Cleaver, businessman Ollie Gates, and council members Jermaine Reed and Quentin Lucas. Reed is quoted as saying, 18th and Vine is a crown jewel of Kansas City and cannot be forgotten. So what do you think this project is likely to move forward with council and public support? I don't know about the public, but yes, as to the council. Let me just jump in. There was a story today after this was initially written that the plan now is calling for 17 million, yeah. not 7 million. Well, if I were the folks on the east side, I would not set my price very low because it is a price, and it's a price for support in the earnings tax election in April. And the view on the east side is that City Hall stiffed them pretty badly over the years. And they finally figured out that the way you stop getting stiffed is to threaten not to produce the votes when you need them. And they need their votes in April uh, on the earnings tax. So it has come time for the mayor and city hall to wake up and realize, hey, there's an east side in this city, and maybe it's time we did something for them, so they'll do something nice 
for us come April. So I wouldn't set my price at $7 million. I'm not sure I'd top out at 17 if I were over on the east side. Just keep asking and see how so, much you can so get. So, Steve, is that what this is all about, not saving 18th and Vine, but doing something that generally affects the east side to get support for the earnings tax? I would respectfully disagree with Woody, uh, but uh, I, I think there's always been the feeling on the east side that they haven't gotten a fair share of the distribution of public funds and tax incentives, et cetera. But, uh, you know, Mayor James has tried, well, matter of fact, what they're doing at Linwood and Prospect, where the city's buying the shopping center as part of revitalizing that part of the city. It's certainly, uh, 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 they're spending public tax dollars and it's a, an attempt to uh, revitalize a very poor area of the city. So I don't think there's a quid pro quo. 18th and Vine doesn't do a lot in terms of economic development, housing, et cetera, for the east side. I, I, bill, I will tell you, they can spend all the money they want. The problem has always well, been management. Mm -hmm. I mean, particularly of the Jazz Hall of Fame, absolutely a debacle. Uh, they have a new person at the Negro Baseball Museum who seems to be kind of getting his hands around it. But, I mean, I could go on and on about the jazz music. There are individual fiefdoms in that jazz district, and there. they don't coordinate. But but another, let me, right. let me ask you guys a question. One of the big problems, not only management, but marketing. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, and you two deal sure. with it's, marketing. It's got to be high. What, what can you do, I, assuming these revitalized changes to the district occur, what can you do to make people want to go there? Even well, aware it seems that it like exists. I, I think Bob Kendrick's doing a great job down there. He's a great guy. I think that... There's everyone that goes down there is from outside of Kansas City, Mike. Like when they're tourists, you know, it's not like people from here don't go. And there's well, they no, don't see, see a whole lot, do they? They don't see a lot, but it's that that connecting that East Crossroads to there is going to be huge, I think. Because the East coming. Crossroads is developing, so it, I think the money would be better spent developing the area between the East Crossroads and the yeah, 18th and Vine. You're exactly right. Yeah. That would go a lot better to revitalizing is to create like what happened in the Crossroads. You create people and energy, and it it, it builds on itself. This thing's an island over there. But raising momentum is really the issue here. 18th of Mine has had terrific investment over the years, and it's had fits and starts because people don't know what the there there is. So to raise that profile and visibility both locally mm -hmm. and across the country is the right thing is to do. Is it salvageable? I think it is, but I think it's really going to take a lot of hand-holding by someone who knows what they're doing over a long period of time to make it really come well, back. Jason, given all the issues that we talk about on Ruckus, mm -hmm. should 18th and Vine be a high priority for the Kansas City, Missouri oh. City Council? Uh, that's a tough one for me because I don't, I'm not in that area, but it, it's definitely well, a tough you're priority in for Kansas the, City, Missouri. Well, you're right, close right, right. Now, aren't you? Right, yeah, I'm close, but, but <laughs> I mean, I, again, I'd rather see that money spent on the East Crossroads and, and bridging the gap because that's going to bring more people from that think it's so far away to that area. It's so really make not it that easier far. to get from Midtown Kansas City down to East Crossroads is developing a lot but, right you know, now. I do go there personally. I like blues and jazz. I go to the Blue Room, that place across the street, the Zydeco uh, the Cajun place. But you, you go down there and that's about it. And there's there's a little juke joint up the street. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, you, you don't, like they have blues concerts in, in the summer. I only know about them after I read the day after it was over. Right. And I, I travel all over the country for blues concerts. The marketing right. has been terrible. As I mentioned, Congressman Cleaver is actively supporting yeah. this. It well, was it's, it's his party, then you know, it was City his Councilman baby. Cleaver Literally, who uh, yeah. was responsible with the Cleaver plan and the changes that initially took place at 18th and Vine. Steve Rose was a panelist on the very first Ruckus program. He's still on with us occasionally, but is seen every Sunday in the Kansas City Star on the opinion pages. Rose writes that his predictions for 2015 were not as accurate as he had hoped. He was sure Claire McCaskill would run for Missouri governor and Jeb Bush would be the GOP frontrunner. But he's already sure he'll do much better with his 2016 pick, so let's look at some. Ted Cruz will be the GOP presidential nominee and lose to Hillary Clinton in a landslide. Dissatisfaction with Governor Sam Brownback's policies will lead to eight conservatives in the Kansas House and six in the Senate losing their seats in this year's legislative elections. Rose is also forecasting body cameras for Kansas City police, defeat of efforts to stop the downtown convention hotel, and renewal, Woody, of the Kansas City earnings tax. So what is your general reaction to Rose's prognostications, Mary Ann, Mary Simons? I think Simons? he and Steve Kraske got pretty together close, this yeah. year. Yeah, yeah. they have uh, compared notes and they pretty much have the same belief of where things are going. And I, I tend to support 
what it is that Steve is talking about specifically. I think um, the election will be interesting. We're obviously, the next several weeks are really going to tell where things are going. But I, I believe what they're saying, that uh, our friend Mr. Trump is going to peter out here pretty quickly, and Ted Cruz will be there ready to take over and uh, face Hillary in the general. I think Rubio still has a shot. I, I don't. I think so does Ru he? It, I think, oh, does he think so? Yes. Oh, okay. I thought he was saying Cruz. Cruz is the guy. No, no, no. no, no I no. said Rubio. She, oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I think. I, think I don't think he does. He's the most formidable candidate for Secretary Clinton. Let me in, ask in Woody. Uh, you got Steve Kraske and Steve Rose, both saying uh, Cruz will be the Republican nominee. Hillary Clinton, obviously, the Democratic nominee, and she will win in a Goldwater Johnson-like landslide in 1964. Do you agree with that prognostication? Well, the years pass for all of us, but that doesn't require us to get old. But apparently, <laughs> both of the Steves have done so. Because one of the characteristics of getting old is that you try to fit everything into some template that you remember having happened before. In 1964, and I was a Goldwater guy from the name Conscience of a Conservative came out and I read it. In 1964, there was in this country a moderately liberal consensus. And I mean it was a consensus. And Goldwater was trying to blow that up. And in fact, he began the detonation of that consensus, which was continued, the detonation continued from the left through the rest of the 60s. But when you are the first guy trying to do that, you're not going to do real well. Then you're Barry Goldwater, who was a hard-edged uh, guy, not the most pleasant guy in the world. And, and Kennedy had just been yeah. assassinated. That on may and have on been the on. biggest factor this in the election. This is not election. your grandfather's America. And today, we are a deeply divided country. And People on the two sides of that division are very committed to their positions. There are a bunch of states in this country that will go for Cruz. I still think if he's the nominee, if he's the nominee, and I, like you, think Rubio's still in this race, if Cruz is the nominee, if you make me bet, I bet he loses. Uh, it, we're surrendering something. The Democrats are trying to hand us the likability factor by nominating Hillary Clinton. And when we nominate Cruz, we give up the advantage. He's not a particularly likable Let's get guy. to some of these other predictions. Uh, Mary Ann, uh, Mr. Rose says Kansas voters are going to dump a lot of Republican conservatives in the election, uh, not necessarily for Democrats, but for moderate Republicans and or moderate Democrats. Yeah, I think Kansas voters, myself included, are tired of being strong-armed, and I think they're ready for a new day. And I believe what Steve said, which is that change is a coming in the state of Kansas. But haven't they said that for a long time? Not I'm not a Kansas guy, but it seems like like every year we just keep getting more conservative Republicans in Kansas. Well, it has happened during the Brownback years, yes. Right. I believe that day is Yeah, the, to the pass legislature it. used to have more moderate right, Republican right. control yeah. than conservative moderate Republicans. Moderate Republicans maybe control. maybe not Democrats, right? No, Steve? Well, no, no. <laughs> the Democrats and the moderate Republicans ran the Senate and they drafted this tax bill. This is their bill okay. that is now in Let's place. Let's go so uh, go very quickly here. Rose says the challenge to the downtown convention hotel will fail. I agree. Is that a Bro, uh, Mr. I agree. Curioso. We'll know pretty soon. The court should rule by the third week in January. And uh, he says that the earnings tax, in whatever form it gets presented, uh, will be approved by voters in April. Well, it will be. Now, there's a little question. The question will be by what percentage. And uh, they need to get a high percentage. Last time it was 78 to 22. But the higher it gets, uh, there might be a chance the legislature would say, all right, how about every 10 years instead of every five years, voting to try to you know, And body survive cameras Kansas for City. Kansas City police, yes or no, in 2016? Oh, if it didn't happen last year, I'm not quite sure why it happens in 16. All right. Rest of the predictions you'll have to react to yourselves. And now it's time for Roast and Toast, where the Rockettes give warm applause or critical guffaws to people and events in the news. We start with Marianne. I'd like to congratulate President Barack Obama for taking a chance uh, and going after gun violence in this country. The very heartfelt presentation he made this week talking about the families who have been affected over and over and over again because background checks are not what they should be and should not be, should be happening in places where they're not happening right now. It took a lot of guts to do what he did. He's standing up to the NRA. This is not a Second Amendment issue. This is safety in the United States, and I congratulate the President. Woody. Uh, toast to the Kansas City Police Foundation, uh, headed by Cy Ritter, former Deputy Chief of the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department. 
they support our Kansas City, Missouri Police Department by putting up money to buy infrastructure and things that uh, that are not in the budget of the city of Kansas City or that expand the amount spent by the city to help the police do a better job in bringing safety to our town. And it's a wonderful thing they're doing there to be congratulated. Jason. Uh, this week, the Royals re-signed Alex Gordon to a four-year, $72 million deal. That's not the toast. The toast is the guys that bought him lunch at Barley's in Kansas uh, this week, uh, proving once again that Kansas Cityans are loyal and uh, will do about anything to make the athletes in the city happy. So toast to the, the gentleman that bought Alex Gordon lunch after he just got an $18 million a year dollar deal. <laughs> Who Steve. are those guys? <laughs> I would like to toast the Gen uh, Republican Party. Uh, it would be funny if it weren't so pathetic that the GOP is entangled in another birther issue, this time with Ted Cruz. Uh, they tried it with Barack Obama to try the de uh, to question his legitimacy as our first black president. Uh, he was always a citizen because he was born to an American mother. It also helped that he was born in the United States in Hawaii. Cruz is also a citizen, even though he was born in Canada. But I, what I, my view is that now the king of smears, Donald Trump, has managed to smear Cruz to the point I think this will hurt uh, his chances for the nomination. And finally, a well-deserved toast to my longtime friend Jerry Fogle. Jerry's the first recipient of the National FBI Citizens Academy Alumni Association Community Service Award, now named in his honor. What a short title that is. Before <laughs> moving to Kansas City, Jerry was a Hollywood actor appearing in numerous television programs and movies. Many of you will recall Jerry from the series The Mothers-in-Law, the movie Tora, 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 and of course the highly rated Fogel and Shannon show which aired for 14 years <laughs> on local radio. And so that is Ruckus for this week. We're back next Thursday at 7. Now for the Ruckets and the crew, I'm Mike Shannon saying thank you very much for watching and good night.